So I must preface my remarks with a word of thanks to uh, St. Anthony's for holding this important and timely conference on the future of religious minorities in the Middle East, North Africa, and according to um, Ahmed, it may only turn out to be the one Sudan instead of the two Sudans, but we keep hoping that, uh, that Musa will arrive from Juba to speak about southern Sudan. And in so doing, I'd like to uh, direct my appreciation specifically to the warden, Professor Margaret, Margaret McMillan, uh, and to the director of the Middle East Center, Dr. Michael Willis, and especially to the co-directors of the Sudanese program, Dr. Ahmed Alshai and Mr. Bona Malwal, at whose initiative this conference takes place. And it has been a joy for me over many years to work together with uh, Ahmed and Bona on many fronts, including the holding of the conference on uh, slavery in Sudan back in 2005. I'm also pleased to be here today representing Christian Solidarity International, all the more so as I am joined by our international president, Mr. Herbert Meyer, and the chairman of the international management, Benjamin Doberstein, and several other dedicated and enthusiastic staff members, um, whom you will see uh, manning cameras and assisting with the details of the, of the conference. CSI support for this conference is a byproduct of our mandate to defend the values that undergird the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international instruments, especially those designed to protect religious freedom. CSI's backing is also a reflection of grave concern about the future of endangered religious communities in a region that since time immemorial has been a multi-religious uh, mosaic and has given birth to three great monotheistic uh, religions, as well as to other faiths. The title of this conference refers to religious minorities. The term minority is well established in the political nomenclature of the Western world and has made its way into international law. But I'm aware that some Christians from the Middle East prefer not to use the term minority. Others, however, do choose to employ it. Whatever one may think about its use, I believe we will all agree that this uh, conference is fundamentally about whether or not broad religious pluralism rooted in the international instruments has a future in the Middle East, North Africa, and the two Sudans. CSI's first connection with St. Anthony's, which has already been mentioned, was in 2005, and the connection was made through the Sudan program, as it was then known. At that time, not long after the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, CSI supported a conference on slavery. An underlying theme was the status of religious minorities in the context of state-sponsored Islamization, including an openly declared jihad. The jihad for which the government of Sudan mobilized and unleashed armed forces was not merely an inner spiritual struggle. The appalling human suffering produced by this war did not occur in a vacuum, but was influenced by political currents elsewhere, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, which were generally um, uh, referred to as the Islamic Awakening. Whereas the slavery conference was narrow in its focus, the scope of today's conference is broad. Hopefully, its breadth will help us connect the dots between the challenges faced by religious minorities throughout this vast region. I'm particularly pleased to see this conference taking place here at St. Anthony's. The future of religious minorities was a central concern to two great historians of the Middle East who became legendary in the, in the folklore of the college. And even though it is only 50 years old, it does have a folklore. Both left a strong mark on a future generation of scholars. And I speak of the first and long-serving director of the Middle East Center, Albert Hurani, and also one of St. Anthony's uh, first postgraduate students, Ellie Kaduri who, after leaving St. Anthony's without a doctoral diploma in hand, rivaled Hurani from the London School of Economics. As young scholars in the immediate post-World uh, War II era, both Hurani and Kaduri had a strong personal interest in the survival of the Middle East uh, religious minorities. 
They were both scions of vulnerable Dimi communities. Hurani was of Lebanese Christian uh, stock and maintained a close connection with the land of his forefathers. Kaduri was an Iraqi Jew who had, in his youth, been personally caught up in the dismal events that led to the demise of Mesopotamia's ancient Jewish community. Growing up at a time of great turmoil in the decades immediately following the eradication of the Armenian and Assyrian communities in Anatolia, both Hurani and Kaduri recognized the acute instability of the Middle East in the post-Ottoman world, an instability that posed an existential threat to religious minorities. Their appreciation of this vulnerability is visible in two early post-World War II publications. In 1947, Hurani's valuable handbook, Minorities in the, Minorities in the Arab World, was published under the auspices of Chatham House. And I believe it remains, as noted by Hurani's uh, able biographer, Abdulaziz al-Sudari, the only comprehensive survey and reference work on the position of minorities in the Middle East. Correct me if I'm wrong, if there has been something published more recently uh, along those lines. Five years later, Kaduri spent the long vacation at St. Anthony's writing a uh, perceptive essay entitled simply Minorities, which was initially published in the Cambridge Historical Journal and again as a chapter in the Chatham House version and other Middle Eastern studies. Hurani placed his faith in Arab nationalism. It was, according to uh, al-Sudari, an ever-diminishing faith, but it was never fully extinguished. Hurani did so in the hope that it would produce the foundations of a liberal political configuration that would ultimately fill the vacuum left by the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the subsequent withdrawal from the region of the European powers. <coughs> Liberal Arab nationalism, he believed, had the potential to provide space and security for Christians and other religious minorities. But he knew that the triumph of liberal Arab nationalism was far from certain. Already in minorities in the Arab world, Hurani draw, drew attention to the rapid spread of what he called pan-Islamic nationalism, as represented by the Muslim Brotherhood. He concluded that if this force to which we might today refer simply as uh, radical Islamism, were to gain sway over the masses, the position of Christians would be endangered. Kanduri, on the other hand, had no faith in any kind of nationalism, be it liberal, authoritarian, Islamist, or secular, as the source of regional stability and a better future for minorities. He regarded the post-Ottoman uh, Middle East as decomposing matter, and opined that only those who are sanguine enough may hope that out of it one day the tissue of a living society will once more grow. If the region's minor uh, minorities were to benefit from the construction of modern uh, nation states as, replacement, uh, as replacements for the Ottoman Caliphate, it could only happen, he maintained, if the Western powers were to, in his words, administer them and carry them through. But Kaduri knew that these powers lacked the will, if not the means, to fulfill such an ambitious goal, and he took them severely to task for abdicating responsibility. It has now been two decades since the passing of these two influential scholars, and the Middle East and North Africa remain in turmoil. During their lifetime, the Jewish communities of the region, with the exception, of course, of Israel, became virtually extinct while Christian and other religious minorities substantially declined. At the time of Hurani's birth in 1915, Christians made up roughly 20% of the population of the Middle East, whereas at the beginning of the 21st century, non-Muslims uh, altogether, according to Philippe Farg, constituted less than 5% of the total population. The creation of new independent uh, nation states has done nothing to halt the downward trend. For as far as notes in the, uh, as, as he you know, observed in a recent publication, nation states have provided an ideological and institutional framework that favored resumed Islamization. 
Today, a vast belt of insecurity stretches throughout the region, all the way from Nigeria in the west, through the Arab-dominated heartland of the Middle East, all the way actually to Pakistan. The region has generally become more rather than less hostile towards religious minorities. Roughly half of Iraq's Christian population has fled the country on account of Islamist terror and the general turmoil that followed the American-led overthrow of Saddam Hussein. A similar grisly process appears to be underway today in Syria, where a gentle Facebook revolution rapidly morphed into a bestial sectarian conflict, one in which genocidal slogans such as Alawites to the grave and Christians to Beirut could be heard on the streets of Syrian cities. In Egypt, the momentum of anti-Christian discrimination and violence that was characteristic of the Mubarak regime has gained pace since its overthrow, with cases even of religious cleansing of Christians from some remote villages against the background of open incitement to violence. Far from providing amelioration, the consequences of the so-called Arab Spring uprising have so far, if anything, produced greater insecurity and danger for religious minorities. It appears that Hurani's fear of the ascendancy of the Muslim Brotherhood and the pan-Islamic forces is now being fulfilled with the quiet but active support of Washington, London, Paris, and their regional Islamist allies. If present trends continue, it is indeed conceivable that within a generation, the Christian and other minority communities will look very much like the tiny remnants of the Jewish communities, notwithstanding the moderating influence of some senior Muslim leaders, such as the Grand, Sheikh, or the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Sheikh Mohammed Ahmed al Taib. The mounting violent conflict between Sunni and Shia branches of Islam has the potential to cause not only immense suffering, and mass destruction within those communities, but also to provide a context for the demise of the region's non-Muslim communities. Already in 2011, the world began to hear senior international leaders, including two of this evening's speakers, address openly the existential threat now facing the, the region's religious minorities. In response to the massacres of Christian worshipers at Our Lady of Salvation Church in Baghdad and at the Church of the Saints in Alexandria, the former president of Lebanon, His Excellency Armin Jamal, stated, massacres are taking place for no reason and without any justification against Christians. What is happening to Christians is a genocide. Within days, the president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, used similarly strong language declaring, we cannot accept and thereby facilitate what looks more and more like a, by a, like a peculiarly, particularly perverse program of religious cleansing in the Middle East, religious cleansing. He placed the emphasis on religious cleansing. Later in the year, following the outbreak of the Arab Spring uprising, Lord Williams, then Archbishop of Canterbury, launched a debate in the House of Lords on Christians in the Middle East. At the present moment, he stated, the position of Christians in the region is more vulnerable than it has been for centuries. Before leaving office, President Sarkozy instructed Prime Minister Francois Fillon to commission Senator Adrien Goudron to report on the plight of Christians in the Middle East. In his letter of commission, the Prime Minister identified terrorism as one cause of mass immigration of Christians from the region. But he also wrote of a still more troubling cause, that is, mounting communal tensions. These communal tensions are deeply rooted in the history and institutions of the region and will be much more difficult to eliminate than terrorist cells. We look forward today to benefiting from the current perspectives of <laughs> President Jamal and Lord Williams and the penetrating insights of all the distinguished contributors to this conference. Dare we hope to be treated to some positive observations, rooted in facts about the prospects of survival for religious minorities in the Middle East, North Africa, and the two Sudans, and the chances of the region becoming a place where all citizens, regardless of religious identity or lack of it, can live in peace, dignity, and equality. Thank you very much.